Good morning and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be the facilitator for today's session with Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar and Lucy Barilock. This is the second in our series on engaging caregivers, a program for healthcare workers. And today we're going to talk about difficult situations, elder abuse, and advocacy. But before they get started, let me tell you a little bit about Lucy and Elliot. Lucy Barilock has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She is presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal, Canada. She has been involved in various research projects and has published numerous articles related to caregiving issues. She has lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy is also a consultant for private industry in the United States, including her work with the WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas. And she would also like you to know that she was a caregiver for her mother for about 10 years. Dr. Elliot McGurmley Sklar is a public health professional focused on supporting the health of the public through academic work, research, and service. He has led healthy aging programs for seniors and for caregivers in Canada, Florida, and virtually. Dr. Sklar is an Associate Professor of Healthcare Science at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He publishes and presents his work internationally, which is focused on the complexity of issues relating to aging and caregiving. Welcome, Lucy and Elliot. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. As Glenda said, today we're gonna to have an hour session. And once the session is over, you could ask questions during. We're going to remain, Elliot and I will remain on the line. We're going to shut the recording. And if you have any questions or any comments you want to make, we'll be glad to stay with you. Okay, so let's get started. Our learning objectives today is discuss difficult behaviors and how to handle them, define advocacy in the context of patient care, recognize signs of elder abuse and how to help, examining conflict and patient care and the role of communication. So let's talk about what are difficult behaviors, especially when a loved one suffers from any form of dementia. Some examples of difficult behaviors are, they could be agitated, the person can have mood swings, being forgetful and repeating themselves, which is annoying sometimes, aggressive, both verbally and physically, they could have mood swings, refusing help with activities of daily living, which is really a big one, being sexually aggressive and using inappropriate language, being um, paranoid or delusional, wandering and sundowning. So some of these are really what caregivers say are difficult to handle. So let's look at the impact on caregivers. You know, many caregivers don't know how to respond, especially if the behavior is completely out of character and unexpected. Caregivers may feel helpless, frustrated, angry, desperate, confused, or hurt. Coping with difficult behaviors can make uh, an already challenging caregiving situation even more complicated. But just this is just something that I feel very strongly about, that there's never really any difficult behaviors. It's just what happens because of the disease factor. So it's another way of looking at things differently. So I want to kind of share some tips for you that you could share with your caregivers of how to handle some of them. So it's um, if it's a new situation or not, they need to make an appointment with their loved one's doctor. I think that's really important because other things may be going on. The person may have a new medical problem, which you're not aware of, such a urinary tract infection that is affecting them both physically and mentally. They may have started a new medication or even over-the-counter medication that is having a side effect on them. And I have to tell you that sleeping pills over the counter can affect their mood for sure. So it's really important to try to understand what triggers the behavior. Are there any patterns? Are there situations that could be avoided? For example, does the behavior escalate in the evening or when, um, or when you think that the person might be hangry or tired. So it sort of kind of gives you a little bit of control if you can sort of establish a, pad a pattern. 
It's important to acknowledge and validate um, their loved one's frustration. Please don't argue or confront them. Okay, that's not going to do any good. What they are actually feeling is real to them. Uh, and it's easier said than done, but please don't take it personally and try and remember that it's disease that is affecting their behavior, but not the person themselves. It's important to maintain fam a familiar routine as much as possible to instill kind of a sense of security. Um, having the same uh, schedule every day kind of helps them. Try to distract and redirect the person by uh, you know, if, if if their behavior, you know, say to them, let's listen to some music, uh, going for a walk, having a snack, come and have a cup of coffee with me or tea, a gentle touch, um, uh, you know, a gentle hug, or, or, or moving to another room sometimes helps. So you're kind of distracting them, but at the same time, you're offering them something else that they may enjoy. It is so important to stay calm um, you know, remind yourself, your tone, they may not understand your words, but they will understand your body language and the tone. Uh, make sure that it's reassuring. And, um, you know, they may be scared. So keep all that in mind, as I said, and, and just redirect them to something else. So having said that, I mean, Elliot and I do uh, other sessions that really deal uh, more in details about how to deal with difficult behaviors. But I'm just wondering, can anyone share an example of how you dealt with a difficult patient behavior and share it with others? And many times it's really helpful to other participants in the room. So let's open it up. All right, all you have to do is unmute your microphone. Um, I see we have someone that have, has joined us with their telephone. You just press star six on your telephone and that will unmute your phone. And uh, we'll love to hear from you. Um, let's see. Oh, you, I want to mention the chat box. The chat boxes will remain open throughout the session. You can write your comments and question there. And Elliot, I see that Rebecca has something there. Yes, Rebecca said, I noticed a lot of caregivers give melatonin to help the person sleep. Will that have major side effects on the person with Alzheimer's or dementia? Such a great question. Um, it really depends on the person. And that's why you need to speak with your doctor first and your uh, care recipient's mm -hmm. pharmacist, if possible, to ask them. Because often a lot of natural things like melatonin can have contraindications with other medications. As an example, if someone's on heart medication or blood pressure medication, melatonin might not be a safe option. So it's very important to speak with the person's doctor and pharmacist. Yes, I often do this Friday, so you are doing who has to see. Um, Ms. Wu, do you have a, a question or comment? Oh, I just managed to join you on my cell phone because on my desktop, on my laptop, there's no Zoom. I couldn't figure that out here this year. <laughs> Then last week I missed the session because technical speaking was not possible. I mean, I was working in mental house at Douglas Lakeshore. When it come to difficult behaviors, uh, it was a teamwork. We were working with a behavior modification agent in terms of um, you know identifying the patterns and the changing the patterns and try to figure out the physiological causes first potentially any new medication i need change the diet i need change of routines if that is not part of the reason potentially maybe there is some kind of something going on in the brain that triggers it it can be a recent events maybe a, another co-patient behavior or intravenous behaviors tones, agitation, anxiety, 85% of the time is us who trigger their mm -hmm. disruptive, aggressive behaviors. So we look into those factors and also we try to stay at, uh, you know, we have to stay safe, we have to stay calm, stay grounded and try to provide reassurance, make sure we are safe too. And uh, there's just a lot of intervention we can do for sure, we can do. We cannot do is just we become anxious 
scared or look scared. We had to pretend until we cannot, you know, we had to be grounded and calm to start with. Uh, maybe there's a medication, new medication, check the bill, speak to the doctor, speak to the caregiver, and try not to escalate the difficult behaviors. Try to validate the emotion potentially behind the behaviors as much as we know, but it's never easy in intervention yeah. per se. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. You kind of kind of put everything that I was kind of saying and sort of validating it. But one of the things that you did point out, which I it's an especially when they're in a care home or a long term facility, is that as a prof as a healthcare worker, they might not know you and they're scared. And I think that's a, such an important thing to keep in mind. So I guess before you even start whatever chore you need to start, a good suggestion would be to just calmly introduce yourself, even if you've, you've seen that person before and ask them very simple questions, reassure them why you're there and just talk about things and connect with them. So thank you for very, very much for that point that you brought up. We also, also had a, oh, please go ahead. Also to add to it, just you don't touch the patient or the client without notifying them. You have to say, you have to see their eyes, try to tell them who you are calmly, no touching, no physical contact. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's another very, very good point. We had a uh, comment in the chat box from Andre who said we had success with favorite music played during personal care routine in the morning, wrapping the person in a comfortable, soft, warm bathrobe, making sure we choose favorite fragrances and familiar baths and beauty products. Also, excellent points. Um, we've talked some sometimes before about uh, the importance actually of aromatherapy and how much that can be helpful in helping to calm a person down. Music is an excellent, excellent technique as well. It helps to uh, really sometimes change a person's mood. And, you know, all of us, uh, I think, feel better when we feel comforted or, um, uh, you know, in a warm bathrobe, as Andre shared. And also he said, pay close attention to the care environment, avoid extremely lit bathrooms, noisy spaces. These are all excellent points and very important as we know that our environment certainly can trigger how we feel in certain ways too. Um, and that's an excellent point as well for meal times, because meal times can be very difficult sometimes um, for a lot of individuals with advanced Alzheimer's and for their caregivers. So these are important things to consider as well. So in the interest of time and making sure that we get to everything in our presentation today, I'm going to continue to move forward. And I wanted to talk about difficult situations in healthcare um, because it's really critical to know how to handle difficult patient behavior. But there are sometimes other difficult situations that healthcare workers can encounter when working with patients and caregivers and, frankly, members of a care team. And these challenges can be different for different people. One of the challenges that comes to my mind uh, is our increasing use of telehealth, which can be very challenging for older adults and caregivers. Um, and it can be frustrating for healthcare workers because when you're trying to communicate, if you don't have that ability for a mutual exchange, that can be frustrating, especially if you're discussing things that are of importance. And certainly healthcare is. You know, for those of us working in healthcare systems, I think that we know that sometimes our healthcare systems can be unhealthy. And that adds to the tension between patients, caregivers, and also healthcare workers. Simple things like long wait times in clinics or for home care, um, missed appointments or appointment cancellations, delays to previous appointments, really anything that could have gone wrong in the patient pathway um, can lead to a challenging interaction between the patient, caregiver, and a healthcare worker. Because as healthcare workers, we're often the face of patients' frustration and for caregivers as well, especially when we consider that the health status of certain older adults whose health conditions are only deteriorating and not improving 
as is the case with Alzheimer's disease, um, can be very frustrating for caregivers and for patients. And we might be doing everything in our power to help and make that person more comfortable. But if there's still a decline that we're experiencing and an increased demand upon caregivers, that can be frustrating too. Now, there are also many different challenging interactions that happen daily. Um, this can happen due to discrepancies in our expectations. This happens a lot. As patients, we expect a certain thing. As healthcare workers, a different thing might be expected of us. And an insurance company who might be paying for the care might have a completely different expectation. And that can create some tensions. Um, it, for example, with the time that we can spend with clients, caregivers, et cetera. So I think that, you know, in speaking with many healthcare workers over the years, there are a couple of difficult situations um, that commonly arise um, when a patient or a caregiver, as an example, has done research online, self-diagnosed, and tries to direct their own treatment. Um, I included this billboard that I thought was so clever, and I use it in some of my classes when I teach health behavior, um, because I think this was such a good example of how to drive people to the emergency room. And that was what the intent of the ad was to do. And it said, feel free to Google your symptoms. Because we all know if we Google our symptoms, well, we must have something then that's really, really, really wrong with us. And it gets people quite scared. So um, hence, it was a very effective, actually, uh, campaign to get people to this North Memorial Health System hospital system, but um, uh, emergency rooms, rather. But I think it's also um, scary when patients or caregivers feel that they're not being listened to. That can be very threatening and also feel very frustrating. Um, at times, um, patients, we know this, it's called non-adherence. If we don't accept or adhere a doctor's diagnosis or counsel, um, that can be very frustrating for us as healthcare workers because we're doing everything we can and we need caregivers and patients to do their part too. So that can create some tensions, um, even in the way that we communicate with the caregivers or patients and we may not recognize it. Um, there are also um, sometimes when a person has symptoms and there is no formal diagnosis, that can be very scary and it can also lead to mistrust. Uh, of medical professionals. And all of these things can create difficulties in how patients and healthcare workers interact because there are inherent conflicts um, that sometimes have nothing to do with that actual healthcare provider. And, and so it becomes very challenging sometimes to deal with. So a good way of preventing and resolving some of these interactions would be to think about the patient's circumstances. Now, there's also wide variability in the development, <laughs> sorry, of appropriate communication skills among healthcare workers. Um, many healthcare workers feel that their training formally does not really focus upon communicating with patients. It's a very important skill. As healthcare workers, we're really also not trained to advise patients in terms of their caregivers, of how to find good information, how to refer patients to finding good information, and also how to tell good information from bad information. So many of us have been looking up health information for years online, and it's very easy to um, sometimes mistake good information from bad. So I think a very important thing that we all need to consider is that healthcare makes people anxious. This, I think, is especially true since COVID. There's more and more research actually about how the experience of COVID made more people anxious in healthcare facilities and also about receiving healthcare. So it's important to still keep this in mind. Provide ways to support further information and support for caregivers and for patients. It's so important uh, if you feel that someone is suffering from anxiety, you know, then there are techniques and things that you can do to help them. Um, for example, one of them, which I have below here, is to divert, distract, and occupy. So you can ask questions like, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for lunch? What are you having for dinner? You know, just keep asking questions. 
And that's a very good way of distracting people's anxiety. It's also very important to be attentive to physical signs of distress. Like if a person is jittery, if they seem very tense, um, you can usually tell in a person's body language. And it's important then to be able to respond to that. Um, it can be an increased um, uh, speech, <laughs> sweating, perspiration, as an example. So these things are very important to, you know, to look for and if necessary, to reassure patients and their caregivers. Another thing that I always tell people is if you have someone with you and if you are able, write things down. Uh, many people forget the information that a healthcare provider gives to them. So it's important that you make sure that you, you know, advise people to take notes or that you even provide them with some if you're able. And remember, you know, I think this goes a long way, and I think all of us receive health care, so we know that when there are providers with whom we feel a better rapport, that build some common ground with us, um, we feel better as patients in receiving care. So these are all very important things to consider. Um, I, you know, I think for myself, working in healthcare, I am more commonly anxious in healthcare settings myself because I know too much. So um, these things, I think, go a long way. And I, I speak as a patient and all, as someone who teaches healthcare workers. So communication is so critical. Again, something we don't always learn enough of in our health professions training. And it's important to break down information into small pieces so that it's easier for caregivers and patients to understand. Goes back to my point about writing things down. You can also ask people to relay back to you what they understood so that if you're providing information that is important, you can confirm that the person understands and is able to summarize the same information that you've provided. Now, this is also essential, I think, during communication of what I call bad news, um, because I said earlier, two pairs of ears are better than one. When information that's being received is negative or even just simply unexpected, it can be really difficult to process. And it's important to be mindful of that with people. Nonverbal communication is just as important as actual words when we are interacting about healthcare. Body language, posture, gestures, eye contact. Eye contact is such a big one. There was a, a very famous uh, drawing that a child did of their interaction with a doctor. And it's something that we use to teach medical students. Um, and the image is of the doctor's back because the doctor is looking at the computer screen while talking to the patient. And if you think about it, many clinics now or clinical spaces, operatories are designed in such a way where the computer is sort of away from where the patient is. And Often that doctor is looking at the computer and not the patient. So it's very important to communicate in a meaningful way, to make contact with eyes, to make a sense of trust, I think, with your patient and with your caregiver. I'm just gonna take a sip. I'm sorry I have a dry mouth today. My allergies are killing me. Bear with me one second and we'll get to the next slide. Okay, better. Now, I wanted to talk about something that you might have heard of in the news in the last year or so. It's been gaining more and more attention. And this is called medical gaslighting. It's been gaining attention in the medical community too. Um, now, it means different things and it also affects different people differently. So medical gaslighting is really when someone does not listen to your health concerns or minimizes or downplays your symptoms or is dismissive. And it has been affecting people of color, geriatric patients, LGBTQ patients, um, women as a huge group there. Uh, there's a lot of studies that have been coming out that show that women are more likely to be misdiagnosed with certain conditions than men. For example, conditions like heart disease and autoimmune disorders. And women will sometimes wait longer for a diagnosis, and it's not because they're seeking out care later. So one group of researchers actually discovered that doctors were more likely to use negative descriptors 
like non-compliant or agitated with black patients noted in their health records more so than in white patients. Now that's a practice that could lead to healthcare disparities. It's also certainly something that we're gonna talk about a little later in our, in our time together today as we discuss advocacy. So what are some of these signs of medical gaslighting? If your provider continually interrupts you, doesn't allow you to elaborate, or doesn't even appear to be engaged as a listener when you're sharing your symptoms or concerns. Your provider may also minimize or downplay your symptoms, um, or even questioning as an example whether you have pain. Now, your provider may also refuse to discuss your symptoms. A provider may sometimes not order appropriate tests or things that might be needed to rule out or to confirm a diagnosis. Sometimes the provider can be rude, condescending, or belittling. And this also applies, by the way, in working in care teams, because it is assumed that different people in a care team have different roles and different status in terms of a hierarchy. So it's important too, because I think for healthcare workers, we appreciate or understand but sometimes we may be voicing something as, um, as an occupational therapist to a physician, and the physician doesn't really make much of it, but we think that it's important. So this is very important. Another big one, too, is that at times doctors might say that your symptoms might be mental or psychological, but often those patients don't then get provided for mental health referral or receive proper screening for mental health issues. So when these things happen, what do you do to advocate for yourself and your patient? And this is really where caregivers can step in and professional healthcare workers as well. It's important to bridge the gap, as I was saying. Sometimes as it relates to communicating between providers, patients, caregivers, and other members of the care team. And that's why it's also important for us too as patients. We want to be heard and understood, and I think the same thing is true for caregivers. So I think this is a good way for us to sort of seg into discussing uh, elder abuse. But before we moved forward, I wanted to ask if anyone had any questions or comments about this. <laughs> I think this is something that's been happening for a long time. You know, we've felt that older geriatric patients don't get the same level of attention, as an example. And we've used that word attention in the past. Um, but this is, this is something that I'm glad that we're talking more about or seeing more being discussed because it's very important. It certainly is. And, you know, that leads me to, to say that ageism still exists in our society. When I did my master's research, I did it on healthcare workers, professionals, and how they see um, ageism, how they see the seniors. And it really was not a good, it was did not come out very well for us as uh, healthcare workers. When I looked at doctors and nurses, social workers, OT, PT, psychiatry, um, we were lacking in a lot of understanding. But what I do want to go back to what you kind of when you were talking about the doctor uh, looking at the computer, right, and not directly. Uh, yesterday, I was at a clinic having my eyes checked. And the doctor was constantly, she was constantly looking at her computer. And I basically had to say to her, do you mind turning around? <laughs> because I'd like to, I'd like to ask you a question. So that really, and she said, oh, yes, of course, she was sorry. It wasn't as if she did it on purpose at all. But it's just something that you might not even be aware of. But it really hit me yesterday. And I was saying to myself, okay, Lucy, advocate for yourself. And I did. <laughs> and it's it's such a small thing, you know, but it makes a really big difference in the way that, like I was saying, clinical spaces are usually set up nowadays it doesn't allow the provider to be able to look at the patient and the computer screen at the same time. And part of that is intentional as well, um, I think to some degree, because you don't wanna share everything that's on that computer screen necessarily, but it, it is important. It certainly is, thank you. Okay, so let's go, we're gonna move to elder abuse. I know a lot of you know what the definition is, but let's go over it again. 
So there's physical abuse, inflicting pain or injury, such as slapping, hitting, bruising, or restraining. It can also include inflicting medication uh, and tampering with medication, giving too much or to withholding medication. That's really looks, it's also a form of abuse. Obviously, sexual abuse, any non-consensual sexual con uh, contact, whether comprehended or not, whether the person is aware or not aware of that. Emotional abuse, inflicting medical, uh, uh, mental anguish or distress through verbal or nonverbal acts as threatening, intimidating, or humiliating. Neglect abuse or self-neglect, that's something we look at that as well if the person is neglecting themselves. Failure to provide food, clothing, shelter, healthcare, or protection. And then there's the financial abuse, illegal use, misuse, or um, concealment of funds, property, assets, or benefit for someone else's gain. Abandonment, abuse, you know, desertion of a vulnerable individual. So these are the descriptions of what we kind of follow as being um, abusive, elder abuse. So let's look at some of the signs of um, of abuse. So it could be that the person is bruising a lot, but keep in mind that some medications can make the person bruise. Okay, so before we kind of sort of um, look at that as an abuse, it's important to look into it to make sure that the person's medication doesn't have that effect on them. Then there could be cuts, there could be abrasions, uh, burns, and other physical signs of trauma. The person is a lot more confused, okay, because uh, they could be afraid and are being abused. Or you see signs of depression that may not have been there before. Or all of a sudden, there's a social um, withdrawal. They're isolating. They don't want to be touched. They don't want to even look into your eyes. And then there's seniors financially, you know, their finances are suddenly changing for the worse. Things are happening. There could be bed sores. There could be poor hygiene. There could be weight loss. Un unexpected negative uh, reaction to physical contact, as I said. Unexplained verbal, um, uh, you know, uh, venereal disease or injury to private areas, self-doubt or unwillingness to speak. There's really, really not themselves. So it's important that if you notice any of these signs, you need to ask the caregiver what's happening. Don't blame, but get the facts. You may need to report the findings. So what I mean by that is so it's important not to automatically assume that this person, that the caregiver is being abusive. There could be other reasons. The person may have been sick and wasn't able to uh, perform the tasks that they should have been. There could be other reasons. And what you really want to do is not distance yourself from them. You want them to be able to trust you so that you can help them that if they maybe need more support at home. It's important to keep uh, in mind that the loved one, the one they're caring, may be abusing the caregiver. And that happens a lot too. So if you see any signs of abuse on the caregiver, you need to gently find out what's going on. You know, sometimes caregivers are reluctant or embarrassed to tell you what is actually happening. They kind of feel that they don't want to get that person in trouble or what's going to happen. So these are all really, really things that are important to keep in mind. And I'm just wondering, um, does anybody have, have you had situations where um, the caregiver was abusing or the the person they're caring for was abusing them? And how did you deal with that? Is there, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I thought maybe I wasn't. Okay, it's a very difficult topic to talk about, I have to say, really, it really, really is. And, um, you know, just to share an experience that I had in my early, early days of being a frontline worker in a home care department, I went in to check, the wife was asking for bath assistance for her husband who had severe dementia and um, everything was going okay just as I was leaving at the door she said to me quietly 
he's actually raping me every night. Mm. And and I was stunned because those were years ago when we really weren't even talking about any form of abuse. Uh, and this was towards the caregiver. Sorry about my jumpy slide. My no, that's keypad is very <laughs> sensitive. All right, so I guess just people are thinking about it. So if you want to put something in the chat, that would be appreciated. Uh, Lucy, you know, what you shared is is very important. I think it's it's important as well that we sort of think about the fact that um, that there are times when a care recipient, as you said, um, you know, might be either the subject of abuse or might be abusing the caregiver. And I think the impact by healthcare professionals in recognizing and reporting elder abuse also for obtaining resources for those who are mistreated can be profound. And we have different perspectives on our roles in terms of detecting and reporting elder abuse. Um, one of the most interesting things that, that I have learned, um, and I teach, I've taught dental students, medical students, nursing students, PAs, TPs, OTs, speech language pathology, you name it. Everyone has a very different view of what their professional role is, which makes sense, but also have a different perspective in their role on detecting and reporting elder abuse, which to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In many research studies, nurses tended to perceive elder abuse as uncommon and generally didn't feel that it was within their role to um, assess patients, nor did they have the time. Um, they relied rather on physicians to detect and report elder abuse. But physicians felt that other patient care issues, uh, namely time limitations and maintaining trust in the clinician-patient relationship outweighed the importance of detecting and pursuing suspected cases of elder abuse. And they relied on social workers to approach these issues with patients. Social workers, although having the most knowledge and experience related to elder abuse, relied on nurses and physicians mm. to detect potential abuse. So it's really, um, none of them felt that it was within their responsibility. And I've seen this time and time again. All of the groups in the research acknowledge the need for more and better education about elder abuse detection and reporting. And you know, the average primary care appointment, if we think about it in 2021, was only 18 minutes long. So it is very hard to tackle everything and have candid conversations and establish a sense of trust and all of that in 18 minutes. What is changing and evolving in healthcare practice um, is that some healthcare settings are asking patients um, among intake questions, do you feel safe at home? Uh, are there firearms in the home? Um, and other questions like that. The concern that I have and that I encourage you all to think about is that if a caregiver and a patient are in the room together, who is being asked that question? It's the care recipient. And will they feel safe about answering that question with the caregiver present? And should we be asking the same of the caregiver um, and in the absence of the, the care recipient too? These are things that I think are important to think about. I do see we have a comment here in the chat. Um, Andre said, this is an issue that especially requires teamwork within home care or long-term care settings, not only to make sure we share concerns, but also expertise, strategies, that's key, and support when you consider that in some cases it may become a serious legal issue, you need all the help and advice you have access to. What an excellent, excellent comment that touches upon all the right things that we've been saying. Thank you, Andre. So how do we report elder abuse? I think Andre's comment was a good segue to this. Um, that really depends on the state in which you're practicing and where you are. Now, obviously, if there's immediate danger, um, you would want to call the police or 911, certainly. Um, but if the danger is not immediate, which is often more so the case, that's when it makes it harder to know who to reach out to. 
If you suspect that abuse is occurring or has occurred, tell someone. Find out what the protocol is in your organization or if there are assessment tools for you to follow and relay your concerns to local adult protective services, perhaps the long-term care ombudsman if you're in a long-term care setting or potentially the police. There are non-emergency lines as well. Now you can also reach the elder care locator um, to get in touch with your local ombudsman uh, through the number that we have here. It's 1-800-677-1116. And um, this line applies for healthcare workers. There are people that can help you um, in determining who best for you to reach out to. Um, and we will be providing uh, their information at the end of our program and with our handout. Now, the laws in most states require that helping professions in the front lines, like doctors and home health care providers, are re required to actually report suspected abuse or neglect. And we have some links here for you, some resources. Um, and this is called um, uh, required or, or um, mandated reporting. Now, under the laws of eight states, any person is required actually to report suspicion of mistreatment. So there are varying laws between states, but most states do have mandatory reporting laws. So we have included a link here uh, for actually three different resources that can help to provide the resources in your specific area. So on to advocacy. Yes, we're going on to advocacy. So important. You know, um, when I teach at the School of Social Work at McGill University, um, one of the things that we, that social workers, uh, the role is to advocate. But as what we're talking and what we're saying today, but that advocacy should be a part, and I'm sure it is, of all healthcare workers, regardless of what discipline you're in because that's one of the things that is so important. So let's just go over what advocacy is defined as any action that speaks in favor of, recommends, ar argues for a cause, supports or defends, or pleads on behalf of others. Okay, so um, I believe that healthcare workers have an obligation to advocate on behalf of their caregivers and their loved ones. So if you see something is wrong, do something about it in order to prevent, um, you know, to prevent something really bad happening. Um, you can also advocate for your client within the system. For example, I know in certain systems, there are very rigid rules and regulations about when services can be provided and when they cannot be provided. But many times caregiver services need them at night or in the evening and there's things that you should really look at. So it's really important to have their voices heard as issues that are important to them. Protect and promote their rights have their views and wishes genuinely considered when decisions are made about their lives, help navigate unfamiliar cir um, circumstances or difficult transitions. So caregiving um, advocacy is one of really an important piece to look at. Now, I would like to kind of open it up if some of you can talk about advocacy and then I could share a little bit more with you. Um, if someone could tell us, how how have you advocated for a client or their loved one? Uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, how have you advocated for yourself within your own agency? So let's open it up for a bit of a discussion. All you have to do is to unmute your microphone. If you dialed in on your phone, press star six. And the chat box is still open. I know it's not easy to ruffle feathers in an organization that you work in. Um, I see somebody just popped up. Would you like to uh, to speak? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, we can hear you. Can you yeah. unmute? Ah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, I'm working in home care SAPA at the CRC Randy Kassan in with a majority of my clientele are Jewish elders. 
okay, elderly. I mean, in terms of either what gave their their interest, their rights, and protect their best interests, that sometimes their family member caregivers would want our client to be placed because when the clients are placed, it becomes much easier in terms of caregiver, caregiving responsibility. But in many cases, our clients are considered competent enough, cognitively speaking. They have their preferences. They want to leave at home as long as possible with additional services and support from different organizations, including private caregiver, family, friends. So in this case, we had the obligation to advocate for our clients' this decision and interests and what their preferences are. Of course, we cannot put our clients at a risk, immediate risk for their safety, right? Their health, that, that is, is a given. We also have the obligation to educate in terms of what the SAPA's mandate is not to minimize their autonomy, is to maximize their autonomy, respect their client's rights in terms of whether they want to be placed or whether they want to stay at home with more services and alternative options. Placement is the last resort. When we realize services are not enough, the risk factors are multiple and the level of care needs are extremely high, high that there's no financial um, feasibility for them to pay extra private care giving services. So we need to be either, way, either working for the clients, for their preferences. The other thing is when it comes to power attorney, when it comes to mandate, we want to make sure our clients' preferences for who will be the, the one given the mandate and power attorney, we need to speak to our clients. And we need to also know where they are at, cognitively speaking, before we can engage clients and the caregiver, family, and friends in their conversations. That's what we do here. You're making, you. a, very, you're making a very, very good point. And, um... You know, where you are at Reni Kassan, that's where I worked for many, many years, but that's another issue. Advocating yeah. for your, yeah, advocating for your uh, client is a big one, especially when it comes to um, care homes or when the caregiver is really having a difficult time and has made a decision that, you can, that they cannot continue caring. This is a very, very slopey slide that you, we sort of are on. So you're bringing a lot of, an, of amazing uh, and very pertinent questions to the surface. So I thank you for that. Again, I'm really sorry about my jumpy slides. Um, my keypad seems to be very temperamental today. Um, I did want very much uh, to make sure that in the program today, we discussed the Ombudsman's Program, um, which is a statewide office that was created under the authority of the Older Americans Act. We have some links here where you can find your local Ombudsman, um, but the office has the responsibility and authority to investigate and resolve complaints from seniors, caregivers, family members about the quality of long-term care facilities, including nursing homes, assisted living, board and care homes, specialty care facilities, and also day centers and day programs. So in any facility in which you're working, this information here to the um, ombudsman, how to access them should be posted in a visible area uh, so that people know how to reach out and who to contact. But they can also be very helpful for healthcare workers as well to help with mediating some issues that you might be having and not comfortable in discussing with leadership in your organization. So it's just another example of resources that are there to be able to help and support you in knowing whom you might need to advocate to uh, for yourself or for caregivers that you might be working with. And finally, we have our uh, promised resources as always. For those who registered today, we will be providing a copy of our handout um, and if you did not already register for our program next week, I hope that you will. Uh, the link is here on the left. 
Um, and we'll be talking about culture, diversity, gender, and sexuality, which have perhaps never been more important than in 2023 right now. And there's a lot of hot topic issues that we're going to be discussing with a lot of new information. Thank you for that, Elliot. So we're just wondering, we, as we said, we are going to stay on for an extra half hour. Um, Glenda always has a lot of things that she wants to share. But are there any questions or comments that you would like to make about the session? There's something from Andre I see. Yes. Uh, two of my most challenging advocacy issues were in one case, the evidence that the legally assigned caregiver and decision maker for a client was himself deemed not apt to decide, and one uh, other when a family insisted on a restraint for their mother, even if it was illegal to do so. Wow. That is, yes, that would be extremely difficult, and I would love to know how you handled that, but... Um... Yes, definitely. One of the other issues that seems to be coming up is a lot of people are aging uh, alone um, and have uh, friends who are their um, power of attorney or um, their designated individual to make decisions. And that person winds up developing cognitive impairment. Um, who then is responsible? So it's... Uh, something that's becoming more common, unfortunately, is people are living longer and, and living alone. Right. Okay, so let's just move forward a little bit. It's up to the top of the hour. Glenda, you're on. All right. So I, I do want to remind you, as Elliot said, next week, <clears throat> that's Wednesday, September the 20th at 10 o'clock, they're going to be talking about diversity and caregiving. So please register for the third in this series. Um, also, I wanted to let you know that Lucy on the 14th, which is tomorrow at 10 o'clock Central Time, is going to be talking about toileting, incontinence, and dementia and what you need to know. Very sensitive uh, topic, something that's been in the closet, and I'm so glad that Lucy's going to be approaching that topic. Um, I'll be back with you with Lucy and Elliot on Tuesday, September the 19th at 10 o'clock Central Time. We're going to be talking about disaster preparedness for caregivers and what you need to know. And uh, before we got started, Elliot was telling us that they had just updated a lot of the material. So uh, I'm thrilled to be able to hear that. The first time um, I heard Elliot and Lucy do this presentation, it changed my preparedness methods here at my home in Central Texas. We don't worry so much about hurricanes like Elliot may, uh, but we have a lot of other natural disasters. So I would encourage you to tune in to that session. And I might add that that session is not specific to hurricanes. We're talking about power outages. We're talking about winter storms, tornadoes. Um, all weather events, extreme heat. Right. That's been a big one in Texas this year. Right. <laughs> so I appreciate that clarification. Um, and I should have mentioned that, but I was just mentioning that you're in Florida. No, of course. <laughs> plus, plus, it's a very active time in, in the season. And if anyone has been watching the news, there are so many storms in the Atlantic. So. It, you know, it's normal for our focus to be on hurricane preparedness, but I think we need to be thinking more broadly these days. I agree. Um, it was interesting. We have a lot of um, fires here in Texas during this summer, particularly. And one day, one was pretty close to me, and I thought, what would Elliot do? <laughs> and so I had everything ready to rock and roll out the door at a moment's notice. So thank you, Elliot, for that. Yeah, Of course. Also, well, before I leave you, I want to say that I certainly appreciated being with you today. Um, oh, okay. I see. She just got suddenly disconnected. I noticed she was gone. I didn't know where she went, Miss we were talking about. Um, I appreciate you being with us today, and I hope you have a, a, a good conversation once I'm off the phone um, and in the recording. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lucy and Elliot, for all that you do and your wonderful presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the recording now. And 
Um, maybe that will stop the recording now and I'm going to leave you. So 